Hi, my name is Sam Romy, and I've been in Alaska for most of my life and have traveled all over the world as a ship captain, engineer, and an airplane pilot. I have a passion for history and exploring some of the most remote places in Southeast Alaska. I'm here to show you my Alaska from the air, water, and on the ground. All right, another episode of Above Alaska. Sam, we got the plane ready to go. Where are we headed today? We're gonna go through the Misty Fjords and we're gonna go over to Hyder, Alaska, one of my favorite little towns that's uh, it's almost in Canada. Wow, okay, let's hop on the plane and get this day started. All right, let's do it. Thank you very much. You bet. I love early morning flying. The air is really calm normally. You get out there and it's just, it's really easy flying. Today, we are flying northeast over the Misty Fjords, which comprise of 2.14 million acres of National Monument Wilderness, containing sea cliffs, steep fjords, and rock walls that jut 3,000 feet straight out of the ocean. While it looks like I'm flying close to the rock, it's really that the rock is so massive it makes us seem small and insignificant. These are places that are rarely seen by the human eye in one's lifetime. Even tourists who pay money to see the misty fjords don't go as deep into it as we are. Absolutely nothing replaces the magnitude of the beauty of this land in person. Here you can see the landscape change dramatically as it has been carved by glacial flow and we gain altitude. There are so many glaciers up here and it seems that they all meld together and become one massive ice field at the higher altitude. and you get the glaciers, which are just big rivers of ice. It looks small here, but you gotta remember, you know, you're up at 7,000, 8,000 feet and you're flying along and you gotta a glacier that may be a mile or two wide at that area. And the higher you go, it just turns into one massive ice field. You get up around the mountains and you get any kind of wind blowing, you're gonna have you know, updrafts, downdrafts, uh, where it funnels through a Venturi effect, and it'll affect your flying. It's interesting all the different glaciers too and how they you know, how they terminate. You'll get ones that it's just blue ice, and then you'll have ones that it's, they're just covered in rock, and then they break off and you'll see the ice. As the easternmost town in Alaska, Hyder sits below snow-capped peaks and glaciers that shine intense blue on the border of Stewart, Canada. In Hyder, there are no police, no property taxes, 
and citizens carry firearms to protect themselves from grizzly bears walking down the street. It's now known as America's Friendliest Ghost Town, but it wasn't always that way. Back in its heyday in the early 1900s, Hyder and Stewart were founded as mining towns on the shores of the Portland Canal because of the elements such as gold, silver, copper, and lead. The area was also abundant in salmon, seal, and halibut. The land was initially owned by two people, causing the rest of the population to live on buildings built on pilings on the tide flats. Between Hyder and Stewart, they boomed with a population of almost 10,000 people. However, after 1956, mining in the U.S. decreased significantly, which caused the downturn in Hyder, which now has a population of about 60 people. Hyder is also the home to my childhood friend, Sven Pearson. Cell service is spotty there, so I wasn't able to speak with him before flying there. But I have a feeling he'll see our plane coming in. After all, planes don't land here very often. Just like I said, he met us at the dock, and now we're loading our gear up to go check this place out. What year was it that uh, you moved to Metlakatla? Was and it 78 or 79? I think we moved there about the same time you guys yeah. did. And I want to say it was the summer of 78. Okay. Right around that time. Yeah. Um, eight, yeah, it was the summertime. I remember we, we that. We have been there about, I mean, within months of each other. Yeah. I remember, I remember when you guys came, you had these massive wooden crates of stuff. <laughs> and we came like grapes of wrath. It was just <laughs> piled all over the top of the truck and in the cars and stuff. And you guys were all organized. And yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, that was, that, that was a lot of fun. It and, was, it, and then it was the uh, old Coast Guard housing. It was. In Tamgus Bay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that was probably for a kid growing up around that time period, it was cool because for a place where you didn't have a lot of uh, new friends, it was uh, it was always an adventure. I mean, it was all these old buildings. And, you know, we were trying to figure out, you know, what was in this one? What was in that yeah. one? And, you know, World War II vintage. Yeah, well, uh, Coast Guard Coast Guard had just pulled out yeah. uh, a year or two earlier, moved to Sitka. They'd taken their new houses that they had there with them. That's oh, right. what those old foundations were oh, yeah. was, down by uh, the airplane ramp. I think they called it Roland Village. Yeah. And it's now sitting out in Sitka at the airport. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then we were in the older ones, and they were built just oh, yeah. stout. They were, they were built good. And uh, yeah, but all the buildings and everything, there was the old school was there, the bowling alley, there was um, shops, all kinds of shops around. And yeah, like you said, yeah. we were going through and we'd find stuff trying to figure out. I remember picking up a magneto and trying to figure out what it was. And I spun that thing. I figured out what it was. <laughs> bam, 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 bam. Yeah, just shocked 50,000 volts through you. But yeah, just all kinds of stuff like that out there it was a lot of fun. Well, it was before computers, yeah. before the internet, and cell that, phones. You know, yeah. you know, we weren't sitting at home doing this bit. No. Um, it was good. We were out, we were having adventures, and um, surprisingly, we survived it all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that we did. Out on the boats, you know, climbing around, hiking over stuff, up on the airstrip, bicycles. Yep. Yeah. No, it was good. We love, you know, sitting on the deck for the morning, for coffee. Not a bad view. And I've heard that, because I haven't really gone up top yet, <laughs> oh. <laughs> that that is even a Oh, yeah. View. You look over there, you see that gray trailer. 
That's actually the border, Canadian border oh. station. And you'll see where the line goes between the two countries. So. I, I was showing them when we came yeah. in, cut all the way up the we mountainside there. Thinking, yeah, people just walked up it with a chainsaw and cut themselves a border. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of the town was over here, uh -huh. and then they started developing going across uh -huh. uh, on what they call International <laughs> Ave. The International Ave. <laughs> Life on the border. Yeah. Um, I am going to pull over on this side. The U.S.-Canadian border was established in 1903. There was a land dispute between Russia and Britain that was never resolved, and the U.S. inherited it when it purchased Alaska. Ultimately, England sided with the U.S. and resolved the long-standing dispute with an establishment of the border as it remains today. It's great, we have our first visitor. You're my first visitor. <laughs> That's awesome. That's hilarious. I'm leaving the American sector. That oh. is hilarious. This is That's awesome. awesome. So is this a U.S. little block house here? That is the... Is that Canadian? It's U.S. Um, as far as I know, it's the first, uh, the oldest masonry building in Alaska. Serious? Yeah. Well, August 1896. You can see the border when you fly in because the trees have been cleared in a straight line right up the mountain. Completed September 21st, 1896. Albert Bay, five days later. Man, they didn't mess around. It was pretty neat. It's interesting how many empty buildings there are there that aren't being, they're just not being used. But I think COVID had a big, big chunk of the reasoning on that. The town had it as a school. Yeah. Until probably. It looks like a school. I think, yeah, it's probably about till the 30s or something like that, 40s. Oh, okay. And, and then it uh, became a customs house, too. Yeah. The next stop on our tour is the Salmon River, which is fed by meltwater from the Salmon Glacier and empties into the Portland Canal. As you can see, this time of the year, the water is absolutely filled with salmon that have come to spawn. Holy moly. That is packed, dude. I know. Oh, yeah. What kind are they? Uh, mostly pink, some chum. Oh, yeah. This is the biggest they've had in a long time. Yeah, you, you can see how yeah, solid. Solid black. It's good to see a good salmon return like that. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, you got Fish Creek that comes, comes down through here, and then you've got uh, part of the Salmon River it cuts in. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how much stuff there's in here. Honey badger ain't got nothing on a grizzly. We hopped over to the Fish Creek Wildlife's Observation Site to the bear viewing area. We didn't ask this bear to show up for our show. There's just that many bears in Hyder that you will likely see one if you stop by. The bears are out and plumping up eating salmon to prepare for the winter season. We ran into this big bear who had the pick of the stream for whatever fish he wanted that day. Maybe he's an environmentalist bear. He's just catch and release. <laughs>
when you get onto the mainland, you get to see the grizzlies here in Ketchikan and on the islands. There's, uh, we don't have uh, grizzlies. One night, it was this, this last week, drove out here, parked, walked out here. It was starting to get dark. I mean, it was at the point where you really can't make out a lot of detail. We walked over there and there's a grizzly down there. And we're watching and it was, you know, munching away in the, uh, the creek. And I said, you know, we probably should go because he probably doesn't realize we're human. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he's trying to revive those. It looks like he's like giving it CPR, maybe. See that? <laughs> we were in search of an old mining equipment graveyard and stumbled into this actual graveyard filled with fascinating history. The brush is overgrown and requires some careful walking and uncovering headstones. But we discovered some really interesting history and beautiful mushrooms while we were there. Graveyards are interesting because you know you get you get the headstones and different kinds of them and you get to see what people did for a living on a lot of them. There's a lot of history in that. Dr. Zink went yeah. and they, okay. they had a... Wow. Um, Did I read that wrong? One year old? 1932? U.S. Navy. Yeah, it's too bad this wasn't brushed out better. That is a military headstone right there. Yeah, yeah. this is U.S. Navy, right? Yeah, well, and... I just did this for my dad. October 9th, 1926. Born 1869. Wow. John Ferguson. That was my first job there in Metal Cabin. the cemetery? Yeah. Yeah, Hyder, Hyder's an interesting place. It's not mainstream, you know, and it's, it's not... You know, you can go around to the islands here. It's, it's like stepping back in time, but not only stepping back in time, kind of taking a parallel path because it's been away from most civilization or away from the mainstream for so long. Kind of do their own thing. The little customs shack or building that they had, that got blown up one time. <laughs> yeah, what? the stories of stuff that would go on in this place. Yeah. Pretty crazy. It used to be like the Wild West around here. Yeah. But most of those guys have passed on and it's just kind of a town of a bunch of old people now.